Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to Scottish Independence Podcasts. We're calling this episode Independence De Facto Decisions. It's party conference season. The British Unionist parties are sticking by their stance, which is no Scotland. We're not going to set you up with a Section 30 to have a referendum. There's no sign that that's going to change, even if Labour gets in, which they, they looks like they almost definitely will. They think they will. <laughs> they definitely think they will, but, you know, I think they will as well. However, so that puts us in the situation that the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, last year foresaw, which was when she set up, let's go to the Supreme Court and decide one way or another whether we can do it legally just through Hollywood. The answer to that was no, you can't. At that point, she said, OK, then in that case, the next general election becomes a de facto referendum. So let's just remind ourselves of how she put that. And this is a clip from Holyrood from the 28th of June 2022. It is, of course, possible that the Supreme Court will decide that the Scottish Parliament does not have power to legislate even for a consultative referendum. To be clear, if that happens, it will be the fault of Westminster legislation, not the court. Members, obviously, that would not be the clarity we hope for. But if that is what the law establishing this parliament really means, it is better to have that clarity sooner rather than later. Because what it will clarify, presiding officer, is this. Any notion of the UK as a voluntary union of nations is a fiction. Any suggestion that the UK is a partnership of equals is false. Instead, we will be confronted with this reality. No matter how Scotland votes, regardless of what future we desire for our country, Westminster can block and overrule. Westminster will always have the final say. Presenting officer, there would be few stronger or more powerful arguments for independence than that. And it would not be the end of the matter. Far from it. I said earlier that two principles would guide what I said today. The rule of law and democracy. Democracy demands that people must have their say. So finally, in terms of process, let me confirm this, although it describes a scenario that I hope does not arise. But if it does transpire that there is no lawful way for this Parliament to give the people of Scotland the choice of independence in a referendum, and if the UK Government continues to deny a Section 30 order, my party will fight the UK general election on this single question. Should Scotland be an independent country? Our guest this week is Greg McCara. We're delighted that Greg can join us. Greg has got a long pedigree as an activist. He's an SNP member. He is the chief executive of the Scottish Independence Foundation, co-convener of the Scottish Independence Convention and many, many more activities as well. Greg joins us to talk about his thoughts for a de facto referendum. What should be our approach? A majority of seats, votes, what is it and why? And welcome Greg McCara to Scottish Independence Podcast. Uh, Greg, and thanks, thanks very much for agreeing to come and come and chat to us. I appreciate that. Going back to when we just had that Supreme Court judgment about how it wasn't going to be legal for Scottish government to lay out, uh, you know, a, a referendum bill. And I think it was just a couple of hours after that, First Minister Nic Nicola at the time was quite plain what she said. The next national election scheduled for Scotland is, of course, the UK general election, making that both the first and the most obvious opportunity to seek what I described back in June as a de facto referendum. As with any proposition in any party manifesto in any election. It is, of course, up to the people how they respond. No party can dictate the basis on which people cast their votes, but a party can be, indeed should be, crystal clear about the purpose for which it is seeking popular support. In this case, for the SNP, that will be to establish, just as in a referendum, majority support in Scotland for independence so that we can then achieve independence. That then is the principle. However, now that the Supreme Court ruling is known and a de facto referendum is no longer hypothetical, it is necessary to agree the precise detail 
of the proposition we intend to put before the country. The aim of using a general election as de facto referendum is to gain majority support for independence, by the way, Scots vote in a general election. That kind of gets us to the nub of an important question, doesn't it? Because you can say to gain majority support from the Scottish people for independence, but then you've got to define what majority support would be. Does it mean majority of votes? Does it mean majority of seats? Does it mean just most seats? Does it mean majority of votes for every independent support? Party? So there's a whole load of detail in there. I know you've thought about it and you know, you've talked about it in various places. So close yours. Tell us what you think on, on, on that. <laughs> what, one place that I did talk about it recently was at a conference from the, the SNP Trade Union Group. I'd like to talk just briefly about it. It's an analogy to what we're discussing here, but maybe sure. a useful analogy. And it's about the concept of escalation. If, if anybody has a complaint, a dispute, uh, or, or anything of sort, a grievance of any sort, uh, then well, I, I was an academic, I, I worked at the university, I could have gone straight to the principal, and the principal would then have said, well, have you spoken to the vice principal first? No. Oh, well, talk to him or her. And the vice principal would then say, talk to the dean, who would say, talk to the head. You work your way up through the system, and if you get no uh, satisfaction at one level, you escalate to the next level, and escalate until you reach the point where uh, you're maybe uh, some, some form of appeal, or even an external appeal, uh, outside of uh, the place where you work and it could be to the courts it could be to, to whatever so that's a process of escalation each stage you have to be able to demonstrate that you have explored a way of resolving the issue at the lower levels and therefore you have to be at this level and that forces the person you're addressing uh, to pay attention to you because it's now their responsibility not those below them uh, several people have been slagging the decision to to refer this to the Supreme Court. I thought it was inspired <laughs> because it does precisely that. Realistically, we could have been in a situation just now where we were having a referendum a week on Thursday. And then this afternoon, somebody lodged a complaint to the Supreme Court, who then issued the equivalent of an interim interdict and stopped the referendum from taking place 10 days from now. And that would repeat forever because there would, there would be tricks used to try and stymie it along the way. Instead, uh, what we did was clear out the way the, the any impediment we got. To, I actually had some optimism that the the, uh, the court, the Supreme Court, would say, "Yeah, it's okay, go ahead." Not high hope, but some hope. But once that was out of the way, what does that tell us? It tells us that we, we're not going to Section 30. Sure, keep on asking, but not with any expectation ever of being uh, granted it by Westminster. Section 30 is out of the way. A referendum, which is uh, uh, approved of and will be respected by Westminster, is out of the way. A do-it-yourself referendum is out of the way because the Supreme Court said that. That leaves us, if we believe in democracy and we believe in democratic right to self-determination, that leaves us other options because we've escalated through those stages and now we're at the point where we actually use and deliberately turn around and use the processes of democracy recognised by Westminster itself. Of course, we have three audiences. We've got the Scottish people, we've got Westminster, we've got the international community. Maybe touch on that later. But um, as far as Westminster is concerned, the only democracy that Westminster clearly represents is Westminster. So to use a Westminster election as a way of getting the expressed will of the Scottish people makes a great degree of sense. Then there, of course, there's the question of um, what level of support, what type of support they would require there. But that's another question. That point you made about we could have been a week and a half away from a referendum and suddenly the Supreme Court calls in, that's quite an intriguing thought, isn't it? I just wonder if we'd been at the stage where all the build-up had happened to the referendum and suddenly it was pulled at the last minute, would that be like taking the cork off a fizzy bottle? I mean, what would have happened? Local government who run local elections and who run the polling stations would very possibly, maybe not unanimously, but many of them at least, uh, would have said, oh, well, that's a legal decision uh, from the, the supreme legal authority saying that this is not uh, a referendum. It doesn't have any legal standing. Therefore, we will not open the polling stations. Even if that happened with one polling station rather than several hundreds, um, then, then that would have been enough to have put a question mark over the uh, yeah. outcome. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's all it would take. Just a bit of disruption could be totally disrupted. And that's why we wanted to preempt it, because uh, my suspicion is that would have happened. But a bit earlier than this, we would have probably have waited until a couple of months before the planned referendum. Uh, and by the way, it wouldn't have been the UK government, because they wouldn't want to have that on their hands. Uh, any external body that had the authority uh, to refer to the Supreme Court could have done it. The good thing is we didn't go down that road and allow others to stop us 
uh, we made a decision which let us know in advance that that was not a route. Uh, and let me just emphasize here that I think, I'm utterly of the view, and I've said it for years, that we should only be choosing routes where we make the decision as to whether or not we go down that road. Any process which can be vetoed by another body is a non-functional process. So, asking for a Section yeah. 30, non-functional. Asking for a referendum run by the Scottish Parliament, non-functional. Let's choose routes where uh, the route is recognised. So, a Westminster election, they kind of happen every few years. Um, they're recognised throughout the UK and internationally. That's that's the, the route to go. Can I move on to the subject of what level of support, what type and level of support yeah. is required? I'm going to use my trade union analogy. Um, I, I've, I, I used to be a UK negotiator. I did not go into negotiations uh, on behalf of umpteen universities saying uh, we would like to have uh, this pay deal and uh, we'll, we'll put it to the ballot. But um, if there's any discussion about maybe having a, uh, a, a strike on it, for example, we'll volunteer to you that uh, we have to have a 90% turnout and there has to be a 99% yes vote. <laughs> But do, do pause on that for a second. It would be mad to set yourself voluntarily at a ridiculously high level. But they could come back and say, well, you know what? There are certain conditions that we'd like to apply, and then you get into negotiations on what is a reasonable level. Okay, why should we say the only outcome of a general election which is credible uh, and which could have any force at all uh, would be one where we had not just most seats, not just a majority of seats, but a certain percentage of seats uh, and a certain percentage of the vote over 50%. Many people talk about 60. Why should we set the barrier for them so that they can say you haven't achieved this artificial barrier? It's, it's, it's madness. So yeah. what, what we can do is for different types of, of level, then we can make different types of advances. If we did, in fact, get, say, 60% and overwhelming majority of seats and all the rest of it, that could arguably be a slam dunk as far as uh, uh, many were concerned. But at the lowest level, if we have most seats, we have a mandate to do what is being proposed, which is to, to start the process of negotiating independence and preparing for it. Uh, let me just make one comment here about mandates. Uh, we'll all remember fine well, 2015, SNP got 56 of the 59 seats. Uh, and that was a mandate for something, but we never really quite defined what it was a mandate for. Nonetheless, a mandate for something. And then it dropped down to 35 uh, in tw 2019. So what happened in uh, December 2019? Boris Johnson got a, an overwhelming uh, landslide result, which gave him a strong mandate, and the SNP effectively failed. That's the public perception. That's not just the public perception. That's also the perception of many people within the SNP, of which I'm a member. The reality of that is that Boris Johnson got 57% of the seats in the UK, the SNP got 61%. The SNP's mandate was larger than Boris Johnson's, and yet yeah. we treated it as if the SNP had failed and he'd won. How stupid is that? Exactly. I mean, I can understand why people think, oh, look, let's go for 50%, 50% the votes cast at plus one. But the, but the way you put it is is um, got a lot of sense to it. Because, you know, it's like whoever wins this next general election, well, it looks, it's going to be Labour, isn't it? They're not very likely to win it with a majority of votes cast in the country. I mean, they might given how far ahead they are, but they're going to claim it on the amount of seats that they've got and, and having a majority over yeah. everybody else. So in a way, so we're just saying, yeah, well, we'll be doing we'll be doing the same thing. And also there's other disadvantages for a de facto referendum like this, isn't there? Because it's a part of the electorate who, who would be voting if we had it as a referendum in Scotland are not able to vote in a general election because of the voting age discrepancies. It's like kind of like having, you know, your hand tied behind your back, really. Um, I think that the polling that Gordon McIntyre Kemp did, though, um, I'm pretty sure that he got them to look at yeah. what is the effect of taking the EU members and under-18s out, and it made less than 1% of a difference overall. The numbers are not massive. It depends, though, doesn't it? I mean, 1% could be massive, if you're thinking, well, if, if you're saying you're that you have 49. to get... You're, <laughs> exactly. That, that could be massive if you're, if you're going for 50% plus one vote. So yeah. it isn't insignificant. It's not insignificant, that. but it's not the game changer that would, yeah. you would base your decision on, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Well, you know, we might not be looking at just one election in here. Um, yeah, the, the SNP will very possibly... I, I don't think other parties, are, uh, pro-independence parties, are likely to win seats. And that, that's that's not a slagging of other parties. It's a, a statement of what the opinion polls project and have always done, and I'd like to. 
So, um, the SNP uh, will probably drop from the 48 they got last time. It, it might very well have uh, an overall majority or, or, or just a majority. And that might be enough to start the process of building up towards a, a definitive phase uh, and a quest for independence. Um, now, it could well be that the actual plebiscite election uh, is the next Scottish Parliament election. Um, and, and in there, uh, it's, it's, it's entirely feasible uh, that we, we could be in the position where uh, there is a, a demonstrated will of the majority of the people of Scotland to support what, what's an offer in there. And by the way, if, if we didn't do it there, we could do it another one. You know, uh, it, we, we, the idea that democracy only happens once or another country gets to tell uh, this country, you'll, you'll have had your democracy and now go back to sleep for a century. <laughs> um, sorry, no, that's, that's not happening. This word mandate, I think we need to think yeah. of a different word. Whenever I hear that now, I think mm, another mandate, you know, and it's, it's become tarnished. I think we need to start framing it in a different way. I mean, it doesn't really mean anything, does it? But, but when it's actually causing people to think, oh, God, another mandate. Oh, no, that means they're not doing anything. They, it really has got negative connotations now, I think. Absolutely precisely, Fiona. They, uh, and, and I had used this uh, argument myself elsewhere as well, that um, uh, going into uh, uh, the last Westminster election, uh, I said to, to colleagues that, um, you know, we, we've got, what is it, five or six mandates already. I, I'm an election agent. I, I, I couldn't easily go to activists and say, let's go out and campaign for the seventh mandate. Uh, it's not a drop, it's not a struggle. So let's change the language. What we need is a persuasive outcome and the three groups that we need to persuade. We need to persuade the Scottish people that they themselves have made the decision that they wish independence. Okay? They've got to believe in themselves that that's what they've decided. Because then, uh, if that independence is denied of them, they'll, they'll feel a sense of grievance uh, and a, a determination to act. Hopefully. That's, that, that's the hope. It's not guaranteed. Um, we've got to persuade Westminster. Uh, that they need to acquiesce to the will of the Scottish people as well. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a numerical mandate is, is not just the only factor in here. It is, as I say, a decisive uh, and persuasive outcome. And then the international community. So one of the, the reasons for uh, using a Westminster election as a way of progressing independence is that we're putting the case forward. We're saying to the people, uh, this, this is what you're voting on. And the international community, we can say to them, we have used the process of escalation. This is all that we have left that we can use. Please respect democracy because it has been denied at all the levels below this level that we have attempted. Uh, it's been cut off from us. Uh, so respect what is left. Uh, and by the way, we're asking you to respect the, the form of governance and decision making used by the body, which you recognise as the authority in, uh, across the world, the UK state. Um, so, you, you use the rules of Westminster, Westminster against them. How do we persuade the international community? Well, the, I, I think there, many of them are waiting, just looking for the opportunity to, to be persuaded. Um, <laughs> that I don't know of anybody in Europe that is saying back to us, you uh, have to do this by getting 60% of the vote. That nobody's putting numbers on this. We are putting numbers on ourselves, but nobody externally is putting numbers on us. Uh, so, let's, let's go down that road. That bit about... We have to persuade the Scottish people that they've made that decision, and it's got to be clear. So, um, I mean, that's relatively, well, if it's a general election, it's getting people to vote for the SNP. I mean, first past the post, it's only the SNP that's going to get seats. We know that. Yes. So yes. There's, there's persuading people to vote for the SNP, but also it's got to be clear in what, you know, the manifesto says or even what it says on the ballot paper. If you do that, you are voting for independence. In a way, sometimes I think some of the past mandates have been a bit, well, not, not necessarily fudged, but, you know, not clear because, you know, like Nicola might have said, lend us your votes. Well, OK, fine, that was good at the time, but actually it doesn't then give you a, a, a clear enough mandate that everyone who voted wanted independence. And that's what the unionists always kind of throw back when in these conversations. So, I mean, relatively simple to put, make it really clear in that uh, manifesto or, or ballot paper what you're voting for, isn't it? I, I think there's a consensus on that already. What, one of my roles uh, in the movement is I'm, I'm the co-convener of the Scottish Independence Convention and on, on their behalf I wrote to each of the political parties. They didn't all respond, they didn't all respond clearly, but uh, what's happened since then has uh, has been quite enlightening. Uh, the proposition we put to them was that we made sure that the very first line of every manifesto for every pro indie party was uh, that a vote for this candidate was a vote for independence. Uh, we're seeing that evolve quite nicely. It's on the agenda. It's 
expected to pass uh, uh, at the, uh, the SNP conference in the coming weekend, uh, one of the amendments in there, which is add the words independence for Scotland to the party's name on ballot papers, but also to put it in the manifesto. So that, that that's an important one. Uh, the, the SNP, like most parties which have got into power, sometimes uh, has spent a bit too much time focusing on how to uh, retain uh, its power, to repeat uh, its, its electoral success for the sake of being in power. I, I, I'm not going to throw that as some heavy criticism. It's a natural development of any party once in power, but it, it needs to be resisted. And if the support for the SNP, as was long the case, and certainly prior to the uh, 2014 referendum, if the support for the SNP and its leadership is higher than the support for independence, then it's too easy to interpret that as, well, let's not rock the boat, let's not push yes. anything too much, we're doing well, we're winning elections. I want it the other way around, uh, and it is now. The support for independence is riding much higher than the support for the SNP, and I, I will argue, uh, and I intend to argue at the SNP conference this weekend, that uh, we uh, now must put independence front, uh, absolutely the front of all of it, campaign on that, uh, and try to persuade the people who want independence that the best way to achieve that is to vote for the SNP. But, you know, we've got more than just asking that. We've got to show that there are good reasons beyond that uh, to vote for the SNP. I wonder if it, if it needs to go even further than that. Using that as an, a reason to get people to vote SNP, one thing, but I think we need to start being broader than that because there are some people who now are in the mindset that they're absolutely having nothing to do with the SNP for whatever reason, but still want independence. And that is probably the people who are filling that gap between the yes vote and the SNP vote. So I think trying to persuade those people to come to SNP might be on a hiding to nothing. Is there a, an argument for saying, we are all working together, these other parties, so we all agree that this is the outcome we want? You know, you can disagree on policies all you like between parties and will do once we're independent. Um, mm. But in order to get there, everybody, at least on that little bit, everybody has to not only be singing from the same hymn sheet, but not kicking lumps out of each other. And as somebody watching from the outside, I despair at what all parties in the independent side say about each other. You know, it, it's just not helpful in terms of getting us to independence. It might be helpful if you're scrapping for a few list votes. But it certainly isn't constructive or helpful getting our country back. Hubris is horrible. Uh, and uh, the smugness that you sometimes get from parties which are used to winning and expect to win can, can really, well, we've seen it in other parties uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, I would like to see a great deal more humility and uh, openness from the, the SNP. I, mm. I may have my own views on certain parties and uh, their policies, but of the pro independence parties, I do not slag them publicly in any way at all. I refuse to do that. Uh, when it comes to, for example, the Scottish Parliament elections, if the vote of the SNP is not 50%, but the combined vote for the SNP and the other pro-independence parties is over 50%, yeah. uh, where is the sanity in, in not respecting uh, the votes that the others have got? So, so we do that. Um, and, and that kind of cooperation, uh, of course, we, we diverge in policy, but um, there's been argument for many years, lend us your vote, and it's simply that, it, it's saying, get us over this barrier, this hump, what, whatever level we think it is to achieve whatever, get us over that, but we respect that that does not mean that you accept all of our policies and are entirely free to argue against as many of them as you want at any stage. We don't own you. That's it. That's the message. We're just asking to borrow a vote from you. Indeed. So, so sort of thinking ahead to, you know, what happens after the general election. Let's say that we have some measure of a majority. It might be, you know, the most seats. It might be a majority of Scottish seats. It might even be, you know, 50 percent plus one of the vote. But whatever it is, I mean, it sort of strikes me when, when I've been thinking ab about this, that it's almost what happens at that point that is more important than the, the election itself. I mean, obviously, we need to have more seats. But after that, you know, a bit of me goes, well, it'll not make any difference what happens because Westminster will just turn around and say no. What do you kind of think is the best way forward, assuming that we've got some sort of level of mandate and the best way forward to persuade the other side to come and negotiate? First of all, there, uh, this isn't a binary decision-making process that we're going through just now. It isn't as if there is one trigger level and we're independent and if we don't achieve that one trigger level, yeah. then nothing 
happens whatsoever. It's not that. It, different growth in the movement towards independence is linearly related to the level of support and the quality and the depth of the mandate that's achieved. You can do so much with uh, uh, a simple majority. You can do so much more with an overall majority yeah, and the rest with uh, uh, you know, uh, majority yeah. votes. Okay. The, the Constitutional Convention, I've, I've got a bit of baggage in this. Um, I, I was a founder member the day, effectively the day after the 79 referendum, uh, a bunch of us in Glasgow formed the Scottish Parliamentary Movement Ad Hoc. It became the Campaign for the Scottish Assembly, which changed its name to a Campaign for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, in the early 80s, I uh, haven't seen an attempt to set up a constitutional convention wither and die uh, in, in one part of the country. I, I picked it up again and proposed that let's, let's go down this road. And the CSP uh, adopted that as a policy. And out of that, grew the Constitutional Convention and out of that grew the uh, consensus policy which was voted on overwhelmingly in 1997. Uh, so, so great. Civic society got together, so it, it was uh, p political parties, it was uh, uh, local authorities, it was trade unions uh, and other civic bodies uh, formed the Constitutional Convention. But that didn't just happen overnight. Long before the Constitutional Convention was set up, uh, there was an attempt by the CSP to have what it called conventions, but they weren't constitutional. Let me emphasise, not constitutional. Could you say what CSP stands for? Ca campaign for a Scottish Parliament. Right. Uh, I, I was his vice convener for a good while. What its conventions did was gather people who were sympathetic. So lots of senior trade unionists, uh, council leaders, uh, members of parliament, individuals, you know, in an individual capacity, uh, coming together in this. But there was no one body which could stick its hand up and say, we as a body represent the settled will of the Scottish people and this is what we want. That didn't exist. It wasn't until we had gathered together enough people that we felt right we could actually now create that body and it will call it a constitutional convention and it will speak on behalf of the Scottish people it was then that we did it so you gather your support and then you have the constitutional convention some proposals you're hearing just now sadly I have to disagree with them because the argument is let's establish the constitutional convention and then see if we can make it representative of the Scottish people back to front the constitutional convention Create is created only when it has the recognised clout, recognised by the Scottish people to start off with, but also maybe some international recognition as well. I like the idea, let's bring people together. The fact that the support for independence is ahead of support for the SNP is partly achieved by support for independence increased and also by support for the SNP having dropped. Dear me, it's created the gap nonetheless. <laughs> in a perverse way, that is a strong argument to say the SNP itself now must campaign more on independence, yeah. reach out to others, find common ground, find a way of demonstrating majority support in Scotland for this big change. And then at that stage, all parties that are for it, all organisations that are for it, and at that stage, some trade unions probably for it, will participate. Uh, I used to hop up with the leaders of the STUC back in the, the, the 80s and, and, and the 90s uh, because they were utterly supportive of devolution. It's a bigger, bigger step to get trade unions to support independence. But you know what? For some, it was a big step to get them to support devolution in the first place. Things can be done. Yeah. 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 Can I suggest a different word to mandates just popped into my head? Yeah. I would suggest defiance. <laughs> the level of defiance, because that, that's what's missing for me in current politics from um, whether it's Holyrood bending over backwards to play the Westminster game and asking nicely and no consequence if they just turn around and say no to our MPs at Westminster. They make some great speeches which are completely ignored. They're outvoted on everything. What is the point of playing this current the situation that we've got? Because it's not working for us. You can probably get us more riled up at the idea of putting our foot down and saying, no, we're not having that anymore, than you can by saying, oh, well, let's play nicely and ask them nicely and let's ask them even more convincingly, let's, let's be even nicer. It just, it seems very one-dimensional to me. I think that's why you've probably got groups splitting off from, from what has been a, a fairly single-minded movement out of frustration at the pace that things are happening with, but also the tone of it. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? There's been at least once, isn't there, where the SNP MPs walked out of the Commons. People were going, yeah, that's, you know, that's what we need to be doing. And there's something about that that catches the imagination, isn't there? And yeah. do you think there's a case for, say this, there's some level of mandate or defiance or whatever, and there's no response back, just 
out and out dismissal from Westminster. Do you think then there's a case of going, well, well OK, then we take our MPs out of the Commons, get them to work up here? It's not a yes, no answer to that. <laughs> but there are ways of doing things outside of the House of Commons that are, are quite useful. Long before the Scottish Parliament set up the, the uh, CSP, again, uh, had a mock assembly, as they called it. It was in the, the headquarters of Strathclyde Region, who were supportive of what we were doing. Uh, by the way, don't forget Strathclyde Region held their own referendum on water privatisation, yes, exactly. and that, wow, yes. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> right. so, so, so they were happy for us to have what we held a, called a, a mock assembly, uh, a model assembly. Yes. Uh, and it had several parliamentarians, lots of local government people, trade unions all coming together and showing what an assembly would look like and how it could conduct its discussions and what matters it would address and what ills of Scotland it would try to resolve, uh, which were being ignored by Westminster. It got some attention, not massive, but that, that was one thing. Later on, there was an organisation set up after the 92 election, uh, Scotland United, and what we did in there, uh, we had a model referendum, model referendum, it was held in Falkirk, and the whole of Falkirk had a referendum, it was a, a, a two-question referendum, basically, do you want constitutional change, yes or no, and if so, which choose between independence and devolution. Okay, that, that was fine, uh, and, and it got a good result. Pulling your MPs uh, out of Westminster, it has to be for a purpose, you know. It's sometimes when parties do a walkout at Westminster, they have a big huff on television and then they go to the <laughs> pub. Uh, I'd rather they did something slightly more constructive than that, uh, which is could reconvene in Scotland or something similar and, and sit, sit there and say, look at us, we will be the government of Scotland working with our already elected Scottish yeah. Parliament representatives. Uh, and this is these are the policies which we, as a majority, would pass if we had the power to pass them. So we're going to yeah. vote on trade union reform, we're going to vote uh, on the racist policies uh, and the repeal of them uh, from, from Westminster's policies, we're going to vote uh, on the rape clause, we're going to vote on all the issues uh, and we'll show that Scotland will vote differently. Pay attention yeah. to us, stop looking at that lot down the yeah. road. That's the thing though, it's a rejection of that part which we, we would then start referring to presumably as you know the, the English Parliament which is essentially what it is. But as long as we don't do that, I mean, we've just interviewed Alf Baird, as we said, but we didn't agree with everything that he said by any means. But the one thing that really has stuck in my mind is this colonial mindset. It's a bit like prisoners collude in being imprisoned. Stockholm as as Syndrome. That, exactly, yeah. So something yeah. symbolic that makes it look as if we've had enough of this, you know. I mean, how many times do they have to breach the Treaty of Union? How many times? Do they have to overturn our democratically elected Scottish Parliament? Because every time we let them get away with it, our power weakens. Something symbolic that you can get people riled up enough of behind. The word that we keep hearing this weekend, it came out of Rutherglen. We heard this in Rutherglen over and over again, didn't we, Marley? Apathy. And part of the reason that vote was so low, we know who didn't turn out. And we were speaking to folk in the street. They were totally and utterly over the whole thing. They thought all politicians were rubbish. They were all in it for themselves. There was nothing in it for them. Nobody was making their life any better. And I think if you want to get those people back on board to vote in whatever arena we choose, to vote for something different, it has to be something different to what we've already got. What you just said about if we take the MPs out of the Commons, it's got to be with a purpose. The optics of that are immensely powerful. Yeah. You know, that would be just incredibly powerful to see that happening. And I must say, I would, I'd just love it as if it, if it gets to that point. And and there's also the point that you know, back in 1707, it was the Scottish MPs who voted for the union to go down to 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 London. So. Uh, you know, there's a there's a symmetry about that, isn't it? Then it's the Scottish MPs down in London who come back to Scotland and start operating as we'd like them to. Graham McCormack said that that actually is ending the treaty, pulling our MPs out of Westminster because the treaty is what put them into Westminster, which is symbolically, again, the optics yeah. on that would be yeah. immense. Now, whether it's, that's yeah. legally the case or not, I don't know. But I think you, you could certainly make a big international splash by doing that. Yeah.
Yeah. We need motivation. Uh, the people need a, a yeah. motive to, to vote the, the way we're asking. Uh, and just shouting at people saying, how dare you not vote for me is, is just not, not very good. It doesn't work. Let me use another wee analogy in here. 2014, the, the referendum. Uh, and I, I was sharing the, uh, the local Yes campaign. And uh, we had particular areas. Uh, I live in West Lothian, so particular areas of Livingston were canvassed very heavily, getting good results. And on the day of uh, the election, uh, of the referendum, uh, I ran one team, local MSP, Angela Constance, ran another team. We phoned each other after about an hour and said, uh, let's just give up, let's stop. And that was because every single door we went to where people had said that were voting, that yes, had already voted or so clear that they were emphatically, certainly going to go to the polling station very, very soon, that we realised doing the knock-up, as you call it, it was pointless. There's no need. Uh, those, those people were doing it because they saw change coming and they were convinced that it was absolutely coming because they could see the argument behind it and wh why, why that should be believed. And we've got to get to that position again. I describe myself as reasonably radical and I'm a change unionist, as I think I've mentioned once or twice. Uh, uh, you know, you, you've got to have a way of telling ordinary working people that your life will be better. Um, pensioners, yes. you know, you've, you've got twenty nine percent of the average salary as your pension, whereas in Denmark it's one hundred and one percent of the average salary. Wait a minute, do you really, really not <laughs> want the status quo? Give them that, a reason for change. Every single sector that you want to win over. Be radical. Be bold. I agree with that entirely. But who is successfully telling that story right now? It's the Labour Party. Now, I will not vote for Labour ever, ever again. But there's a lot of people who, if they're looking for change, the Labour Party were the ones that, that are promising it. And while I don't think they're ever going to be as popular in Scotland as they ever were, if you think of how... SNP at Westminster, doesn't matter what they propose for change, it's not going to get any traction at all because of the sheer numbers. Whereas Labour in power at Westminster, I get the attraction of that as somebody who actually can deliver change. Now, whether they will or not, or not, because as we know, they're trying to become Tories to appeal to the Tory voters. It's not a nice situation, but I think they are winning the war of communication. We can't go out there and say, vote for us for change when we're the ones who are empowering Scotland. So whatever you vote for in Scotland is what you're going to get. We can't say vote for us for change at Westminster because we can't do anything because there's not enough of us. We're, we're in a slightly unusual phase of politics just now, uh, mm -hmm. heading towards the general election almost certainly next year. Uh, and people are desperate for change. Uh, throughout the whole of the UK, I think the Labour Party will either have a, an overall majority, medium-sized, uh, uh, or it'll be hung Parliament. And then what? And then what? Uh, because we could say just now, ah, but don't believe them, don't believe the promises, they promise this, that, the other, and they'll fail to deliver. And we can say it as much as they want, but people are desperate for change, and they'll have hope, they'll have to put their trust somewhere. And therefore, uh, the Labour Party will probably win some seats in Scotland and definitely win se lots of seats in England. It's what happens after that. Now, this is the phase that we're going through just now. I think we have to get through that phase. Uh, and at the other end of it, that's where the, uh, the half promise uh, that would look after uh, people who are struggling uh, will become uh, clarified by no action. And excuses that it's all because of the big Tories who did all these bad things and right do anything about it now. Uh, and the disappointment uh, with the Labour Party at that stage uh, leaves one place for people to go, which is independence. Uh, and it makes the case a bit easier. I believe we'll have to go through a slight slump uh, next year before we then get into the space where the, the promises are demonstrated as being false rather than hope not to be false. Um, and at that stage, we can then say, right, you, you only have one credible way to go ahead. Don't trust a London-based party to look after your interests. None of them are doing it. Trust Scottish parties, plural, uh, to look after your interests because that's our job. That's our definition. <laughs> Therefore, I say two phases of West Westminster uh, to, to get some form of mandate to do some campaigning on independence, followed by a Scottish Parliament election, which will take place after a Labour Party uh, has demonstrably failed to deliver. If we're going to use the Westminster election as a mandate that like defiance against Westminster and this means you're voting for independence then the next thing that happens if we do what is being asked of us the next thing that happens needs to be get us towards independence it can't be right now we'll wait and see how crap Labour are in power Fiona, Fiona, you're, you're describing a binary decision in there, and I talked about a kind of linear range of decisions and, uh, and outcomes. Uh, the, the general election next year, if there is an overall majority of MPs, then that could be construed as a, shall we call it a mandate? 
to start negotiating independence. If there's a majority vote, that it's more than just some kind of mandate, the process will start, and that is it, and we shouldn't allow everybody to try and stand here. But, but it's not binary, because if we achieve less than that, then there is still something that we can gain from it. And if the SNP gets, uh, for example, the biggest number of seats, or preferably even the, uh, the majority of the seats, then that gives uh, a rationale for them uh, and uh, support for them to, to actually do much of what you're asking for. I don't believe that we can deliver independence for Scotland until such times as we're able to point at some result somewhere and say that shows that the Scottish people want it. And until we do yes. that, it's actually it's, it, yeah, it's wrong. We, we can still do things rumbling away in the background all the way through here. I talked about increasing the support for independence. Um, I, by the way, I, I, I don't greatly care about political parties. I've been in the SNP decades, but uh, my, my, my commitment is independence. And if there are better vehicles that go in there, grand. But actually, there's only one really big juggernaut at the moment, and that's why I'm in it. But we, we ramp up support for it. There are other ideas out there. You talked about conventions. You talked about uh, withdrawal from Westminster. There's one being floated just now, which is uh, over 70 years old. You won't remember it, and I don't either. It happened a few <laughs> years before I was born, uh, but it's Scottish Covenant uh, and the collection of signatures yeah, yeah. from people, a couple of million signatures. Now, uh, there is no serious discussion beginning uh, on doing that again. Now, it failed. Uh, the stories are famous. I saw the books in the Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow showing signatures in it. And if we start the process and get close to uh, a, a critical figure and uh, beginning to look unassailable, surpass that figure, and uh, you're pretty well delivered. Now that is that is that process ramps up. It's a it's a ratchet. It ramps up the demonstrated support for independence continuously, and that's a useful thing to the background because the threat to Westminster, if they don't capitulate to our demands, increases by the day, by the week. I like that idea for that reason. You're going to hear more of that in the near future. It's about to be launched. Not by yeah. myself. It's others doing that. But uh, good luck to them on it. It was in the national last week. Robin McAlpine. That's the one. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, l I listened to Robin doing a presentation in that last week in the Scottish Independence Convention. That is one. There are many ideas out there, and you've mentioned other people's ideas, which, you know, I, I refuse to dismiss any of them, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, all ideas should be brought for discussion. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. There's, there's an expression I used just last week chatting to friends that, uh, that it came from a, uh, a sci fi book that I read when I was a kid uh, by Robert Heinlein. And the line that he used in it was, Don't jump to conclusions, you might scare the best ones away. Uh, and, and therefore, preemptively dismissing other ideas is just wrong. Listen to the ideas, analyse them, see if there's grains or whole bucketfuls of truth in them, uh, and have the humility to change your own views uh, if you're persuaded by the arguments of others. And once we've got that level of humility and cooperation, then we can actually march in step towards independence instead of dancing around each other. That's great. I really like that. I really like the, the language like it, what you started off with, you know, and like making comparisons with trade union um, things like escalation. So you escalate something up and, and it's, it's important to go through all of those stages in order to have legitimacy when you get to higher one. It's really important for people to understand that. And yeah, you know, ratcheting things up after this uh, next general election, whether it, we take the MPs out or whether, you know, we do something like get and collect all those, you know, a couple of million signatures to say, I want to be independent. It's just really good talking to you and thank you you know, so much for coming in and uh, wish you well in the coming days when I know you're going to be kind of speaking to some of these ideas at the, at the SNP mm -hmm. conference. So yeah, good luck with that. Thank you so Thank you very much. much. I thoroughly enjoyed the chat. Thank you, Marley. Yes. Thank you, Fiona. I, I don't know about you, Fiona, but I'd, I really appreciate the way oh, very that interesting. Laid, how he laid it out, how he brought in, you know, ways of looking at things from, you know, trade union and negotiation kind of steps and dealing with issues to that. That's that bit about escalation that he mentioned at the beginning. He's just put it all into a really good perspective and brought up some things that people need to think about. I mean, for example, that one, it's not an either or situation. It's a progression. It's going to be a series yeah. of steps. You know, I said at the beginning, this is party conference season. The SNP conference is happening in a few days from when we're um, publishing this podcast. So our plan is to revisit this theme, isn't it? To come back with a different set of guests see what comes out of that conference. If anybody missed our interview with Graeme McCormack, which we did a couple of weeks ago, that's another set of proposals yeah. that could play into this conference. Yeah. There's lots of different views about what's best. And I really enjoyed listening to Graham when we had him on the show, yeah. but I equally found Greg quite 
convincing the way he discussed why would we give ourselves a higher bar for success than we need to and you know whoever wins the general election they might have 40 percent of the vote but they will have a majority of yeah. seats yeah exactly. so why would we go for anything different yeah. and i think the the explanation of how it's sort of a ramping up process is yeah. quite helpful but what do you think maybe some people have got completely different ideas if yeah. so let us know thanks for listening and if you enjoyed the program like our page go into youtube like this uh, video but also join the community there it all kind of helps us get a little bit further reach in what we're trying to do see you soon